How many of you brought your Bible tonight? Will you hold up the Bible all over the building? I want to ask you to join me, if you will, on page number 955. If you have an old Schofield Bible, 955. And if you'll join me there, and, uh, or page uh, 955, or the book of Habakkuk. Uh, Habakkuk chapter 1, and I want to read some verses here in just a minute, then I'll ask you, if you will, to leave your Bibles open and to follow me along in this text tonight. Habakkuk chapter number 1, 955, if you have an old Schofield Bible. Could I just mention this while it's on my mind, too? A couple of things. My mind is going a lot right now, but we are working, uh, trying to put together a hall of a, a, a wall of history about our church, which will be right when you walk in the door on the left on that big wall over there. And so if you're listening or maybe you uh, maybe didn't get the announcement on Sunday night, but you have a picture of one of the former pastors here or something of that nature, uh, we would sure love for you to get in touch with us here at the church office. We'll come get it if we have to, but I'd like to get a picture, if I could, of all the pastors. I've got one, of course, of Brother Gross. I think I've got one of Brother Phillips, but going back farther than that, uh, I boy, that gets kind of few and far between uh, before that, prior to that. I think Brother Phillips... Uh, probably left here in about, I don't know, maybe 55, 54, 55, and he started pastoring around 40, 1940, maybe 41. And uh, so going back into those 30s and all the way through the 20s, uh, boy, it gets scarce back in there. But if you happen to have a picture of one of those former pastors, if you would let me have it, I'll take good care of it and get it back to you. And uh, so uh, uh, if you could help me with that, I'd appreciate it. Our Christmas celebration is going to be scaled back some this year, obviously, because of the COVID. We're not having a children's program. And uh, so, but we will be having a choir program on December the 20th on that Sunday night. The choir will be presenting some special music for us that night just to kind of enhance a little bit of the Christmas celebration. And then on the 23rd, which will be the Wednesday night before Christmas, we'll be having the carols by candlelight. We are doing something special for that, a little bit different this year uh, for the carols uh, for candlelight, not in the normal that we normally would do. We're going to do something different this year. And uh, so I'll explain that. But let me say this, in that service also, if you've had a loved one that has passed away this year, uh, if you would get me a picture of them, we'd like to kind of do something special about all that on that December the 23rd night as well. All right, could you help me with that, if you will? And if you didn't get all that, see Brother Mark, he'll tell you about it after church tonight, and that'd be a blessing. Well, Habakkuk chapter 1, if you're there, would you say amen? amen. Habakkuk. What about that? Say that five times real fast. Habakkuk. Uh, I like that name. It means to wrestle, or it means to embrace and uh, that's what his name means. Let me just read verse, maybe a couple of verses here, verse 1 and verse 2. The burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see. O Lord, how long shall I cry, and thou wilt not hear? Even cry unto thee out of violence, and thou wilt not save. Let me get verse 3. Why dost thou show me iniquity, and cause me to behold grievance? For spoiling and violence are before me, and there are that raise up strife and contention. Now please leave your Bibles open here, and I, I want to try to offer up an explanation of this because I really think it fits a lot into this day and age in which we're living in. This text does, and I think there's something here that hopefully will encourage our hearts. Let's pray. Father, bless your word now. We pray. Thank you for the good songs tonight. You are. What a Savior. Amen. What a Savior. And then I can say amen to that. You love me even when I fail you. Thank you for that. What a wonderful God you are. And I'm glad I can say you're my God, like Thomas did. Oh, Lord, my God. Lord, I'm glad I can say you're my God. And I'm glad I can say I'm your child. Thank you for being a wonderful God. Bless your word now. These folks, many of them hadn't even been home yet. They just come here to church and uh, they come tonight to hear the Bible. And I pray the Spirit of God will just have something for us to encourage us as we live out these uh, last days here upon this earth. Help us, I pray from the text, in Jesus' name, amen. A couple of weeks ago in our Wednesday evening service, I spoke from the book, the Old Testament book of Habakkuk. And I called Habakkuk, I called him this, he was the prophet with a problem. The prophet 
with a problem. As I told you last time, right at the end of our Old Testament, there are 12 books that are commonly referred to as the minor prophets. This book of Habakkuk is one of those final 12 books in the Old Testament. But as we read this book, as well as all the other books, but as we read this book, we find that although he may be known as a minor prophet, we also know that he had a major, a major message. But here's the thing about Habakkuk. You know, normally the prophets were men who spoke to the people for God. They were God's voice to the people. However, Habakkuk was a little bit different in the fact he didn't speak to the people for God. He spoke to God for the people. This whole book here is just a conversation that goes on between Habakkuk and God. He was a prophet that was confused and bewildered by all that he saw happening in his day. Habakkuk lived during the days of Jeremiah. So Jeremiah and Habakkuk, they were contemporaries. What I mean by that is they prophesied long about the same time. And if you remember, those days were the days right before the destruction of the city of Jerusalem and the captivity of God's people. Well, old Jeremiah prophesied in those days. We have his book, one of the longest books, the longest book in the Bible as far as words go. And, uh, and yet when he prophesied during those days, he wept over the condition of the people. He's known as the weeping prophet. In the New Testament, you may remember one time that Jesus asked the people, asked his disciples, he said, whom do men say that I am? And one of the answers that they got, he got from his disciples, where he said, or oh, some say you're John the Baptist, or others say that you're Elias, or still others say that you're Jeremiah the prophet. Now, I think he was like John the Baptist because he had power. I think he was like Elijah because, uh, uh, because of, uh, of his great passion for God. But I think he was like Jeremiah because of his pity. Jesus often wept just like Jeremiah did. Jeremiah prophesied and wept about it. But old Habakkuk, he prophesied and he wondered. He had more questions than he did answers. And basically the two things that really puzzled Habakkuk was number one, what was happening? And number two, what wasn't happening? I think the two things that really troubled him was what was going on, and number two, what wasn't going on. Now, as far as what was going on, let me tell you this. Habakkuk looked around. If you looked at verse 2, he said, Lord, how long will I cry? Verse number 3, why do you show me everything that's going on, Habakkuk said. Why am I seeing all this? And if you'll go over, and we won't do this, but if you were to go over to chapter number 2, Habakkuk mentions the, the, uh, the, the condition of the land, the people of the land in the time that he prophesied. And what he did over in chapter number 2, he talked about the injustices that was going on in the country uh, during that particular time. All the Boy, that's a word we hear a lot today, injustice. Boy, we hear that a lot today, don't we? Boy, I tell you what, this candidate, I heard the, I've heard the former president all week long uh, say, hey, get out and vote for John Oscar. Now, we can't do that. We're not in Georgia. But he said he will correct all the injustices going on in our nation. Well, I will tell you something, friend. There's not many, uh, not near as many injustices going on in America as they would have us uh, lead us to believe. Can I have an amen? But back during the day of Habakkuk, man, the land was filled with injustice. I mean, God's people, the, the people that were trying to live for God were being treated very cruelly, very harshly by the, the upper crust of the society of that day. So he spoke about the injustices of the land. He talked about the iniquity of the land. Over in chapter 2, he talks about how that they were given to alcohol. In the, boy, that sounds familiar, you don't it? They were given to alcohol. And he said this, Woe be unto the man that puts a bottle to his neighbor's lips. He talked about the injustices. He, he talked about the iniquity. He talked about the immorality that was going on in the land. When they were getting drunk, guess what they were doing when they got drunk? They taking their clothes off, getting naked. Boy, don't this sound like America. The injustices, the iniquity, the immorality. And then he spoke about the idolatry that the land was full of back in that particular day. And Habakkuk was puzzled by all that. He saw what was happening, but what really bothered him was what wasn't happening. That is, why was God allowing all this to go on? You see, it's almost like I need to remind you with the injustice, the iniquity, the immorality, 
and the idolatry, these were still God's people. You figure that one out. All that was going on in the land, and Habakkuk said, I see it. But the thing that I don't see that really bothers me is, why isn't God doing something about all this? Why isn't God, why doesn't God do something about all the, all the, the problems that are going on in our land? Why didn't he step in and stop this, Habakkuk was saying? Does he not care? Has he just lost, become disinterested with his people? Has he just wrapped himself up in the clouds of heaven and disconnected himself from the earth? Has he forsaken the earth? Has he lost control? All this is going on. These are God's people. This is happening. And where is God at in all this? I mean, he's, he's upset because of what he wasn't, he wasn't seeing. By the way, he's not just asking God, God, what's going on here? He's praying about it. Look in verse 2 of chapter 1. How long shall I cry? It's one thing to complain about something. It's another thing to pray about it. It's one thing to question. God, we look around, we see all this happening. God, what is going on? Where are you at? Why don't you do something about this? It's one thing to say that. It's another thing to pray about it. And he said in verse 2, Man, I'm crying. I'm crying unto thee. I, I'm seeing all this. I'm crying. It seems like you are not hearing. He was praying about the situation of his land. I guess maybe the question that Habakkuk is asking at this point is this. God, are you really there? God, where are you at with all that's happening in our land? Now, I know, I get it, we're too spiritual to admit this, but how many times have we felt the same way? We look around, we see all that's happening, sometimes in our own personal lives, uh, we look around and see that all that's going on in our land today. Have you thought recently, God, are you really there? God, do you not see what is happening? Let me bring this a little closer to home. You know, recently we have seen what has happened in our nation. And we have a president. I'm talking about President Donald Trump. And it seems like to me that he has done a lot of things to help our nation. He's done three particular things that are really important to us as the people of God. Number one, he's took a stand with the nation of Israel. That's very important to us as the people of God. We understand that if we bless Israel, God will bless us. We understand if we curse Israel, if we're bad to Israel, God will be bad or curse us. I appreciate the, the stand that our president has taken for the nation of Israel. He stood with Israel. What about this one? He stood against abortion. Now, I appreciate that. I appreciate the, uh, the Supreme Court, you know, that we've got now. At least uh, some of them ain't what I think they think and they say they are. But, uh, I mean, I, I see that he, he stood against abortion. Number three, he stood with the church. I mean, thank God he said back in July, let the people go to church again. Hey, I appreciate all that. And now we turn right around and it seems like we're getting ready to get a president that's going to undo everything that he's just done. It, it, it turns right, we turn right around and we just, we, we're getting the complete opposite of, 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 of what we've had. And by the way, let me say this. I don't want to make you mad. And I know we're all ticked off about this right now. But we better pray for Joe Biden. Am I right? We better pray for Joe Biden. We don't want her. No, sir. The only thing I can think of is worse than having him is having her. I'm talking about koala. We don't want her. We better pray for him. Bless his heart. He's done broke his ankle. His dog done broke his ankle. We better pray for him because I can't think of anything worse than having him than having her. And the truth of the matter is, I mean, here we are. We see this happen, and we just almost want to look up to heaven. I'm saying God's people say, God, are you there? God, why is this happening? Maybe I'm speaking to people here in this church tonight, and you've tried to be faithful to God, and you just lost your job. Are you there? 
Maybe I'm speaking to somebody in this church tonight. You've been trying to live for God and your child has just went out and broke your heart. God, are you really there? Maybe I'm speaking to somebody in this room tonight and you've tried to live for God, but your marriage is on the rocks. God, are you really there? Maybe I'm speaking to somebody who have been trying to do what's right and you've just got a bad diagnosis from the doctor. God, are you really there? Well, that's, that was Habakkuk. He saw all this happening in his land. He didn't see God doing anything about it, so he just looks up to heaven almost and says, God, I don't get it. I don't understand. You tell us in the world that if we do this, we're going to suffer the consequences of it, and yet it's being done. I don't see you doing anything. God, are you really there? But then God chimes in in verse number 5 of chapter 1. God answers Habakkuk back. And he says in verse number 5, in essence, Habakkuk, what you don't understand is all the while you've been thinking I've not been doing anything. What you don't get at Habakkuk is this. Man, I've been very busy doing something about all this. You know, God doesn't have to be, God doesn't have to be seen to be at work. God, uh, Habakkuk said, God, you're inactive. God said, nope, what you're wrong about is I have been very active and I'm getting ready to do something and if I told you what I was getting ready to do, you wouldn't even believe what I'm getting ready to do. That's what he said there in verse number 5. He said, I, I will work a work in your days which you will not believe though it be told you. God said, the whole time you've been down there calling, crying out to me, I've been up here maneuvering the pieces, I've been up here pulling the levers, I've been up here pushing the buttons. Oh no, you think I don't care. I'm, I, I care very much and I'm very much active in all that is going on in your land. And then if you'll look at verse number 6, he begins to unveil what he's about to do. Now look at verse 6. For, I, for lo, I raise up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, which shall march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. So God said this, hey, you think I ain't been doing nothing, but I'll just tell you, I've been getting ready for years to bring the Chaldeans upon, upon this place. God said, I, I've got a plan. I'm getting ready to bring upon Judah the Chaldeans. And here's the problem. When he said this, Egypt was the world power, not Babylon. But God said, hey, I'm just getting ready to set Egypt aside. I'm getting ready to bring the Chaldeans ba down, the Babylonians down, and they're going to come and they're going to be my whip, my scourge, to correct the iniquity of the people of God. And when you begin reading with verse 6 and go down through verse number 11, what God says is about to happen is very, very scary that's right. If you read on down here, verse 7, they're terrible. Talking about these Chaldeans. By the way, the Chaldeans and the Babylonians, same people, same people. And he said that they're terrible, they're dreadful, their judgment, their dignity shall proceed of themselves. Their horses are swifter than the lepers. Uh, he said they're more fierce than the evening wolves. Verse 9, they shall come all for violence. Verse number 10, they scoff at the kings and the princes. In other words, what he's trying to say is this, man, it is going to be spooky what I'm getting ready to do upon this land. You think I ain't been busy, and the whole time I've been working behind the scenes. But now, uh, this brings up another problem. Because just as sure as God said all that, it throws, it throws, uh, it throws old Habakkuk in a tailspin. He don't understand it now. So, God, why don't you do something? God, are you really there? And God begins to lay out what is about to happen. And by the way, somebody said, how in the world could God do this to his people? How in the world could God bring this fierce army and this fierce enemy upon his very own people? The answer to that question is simple. God didn't do it. They did it to themselves. There is a law in the Bible that still works to this very day, and it says this, Be not deceived. God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. That one law, that law that's on the screen right now is irrevocable, irreplaceable and irreversible. You know, a lot of times we blame God for things that goes on in our life when what we really ought to do, go in the bathroom, switch the light on, look in the mirror, there's the problem. The problem's not there, the problem's right here. 
And a lot of times we want to blame God for stuff that's going on when in reality it's not God's fault that we got in the mess that we got in. It's through our own bad choices and bad decisions and God has to step in and clean the mess up. And it's not His fault. It's our fault. I told you, I hate to tell you, but I told you about that old boy that got mad at me that day and used to come to church here and, and he got mad at me. He was in the discipleship class years ago. He got mad at me, called me one day and said, I ain't never come back to church again. I said, really? He said, no. He said, I'm, God's let me down. I said, what are you talking about? He said, well, he said, uh, my wife just run off and left me. He said, I can't find a good job. Seems like everything I touch just becomes unraveled. He said, God's not been fair to me. Now, he's a big old boy. This guy's a big old boy. But we were on the phone. And since we were on the phone, I knew he couldn't get to me. So I waxed a little bit bold myself. And here's what I said. So you're saying that God's let your wife run off from you, but didn't you tell me you met her in a bar room? What kind of wife do you expect to find in a bar room? And didn't you tell me you had several felony charges and all kind of drug charges and you've been in and out of prison? No wonder nobody wants to give you a job. And I said, Pete, the problem's not with God. The problem's with you. You need to go in the bathroom, look in the mirror. Don't blame God for the mess you're in. You're the one that's made the mess. I was on the phone, so it didn't really matter at that particular time. But that's the way it is. It's not God's fault that we have to go through all the correction and the chastisement. We're the one who brings it upon ourselves. Habakkuk said, God, are you really there? Habakkuk, yes, I've been working. You're not going to believe what's about to happen. I'm bringing this nation down upon you. It is going to be unbelievable. And then that throws him in another tailspin because Habakkuk not only asked the question, God, are you really there? In the rest of the chapter, he asked this question. God, do you know what you're doing? As if somebody like us can look up to heaven and say, God, do you know what you're doing? You see, the problem now that Habakkuk gets bent out of shape over is this. How can God bring upon a bad people, and excuse my English here, but how can God bring upon a bad people, a badder people, and chastise them with it? In other words, here's, here God said, hey, I'm going to use these Chaldeans. They're going to come down. They're going to straighten you all out. They're going to correct the iniquity. They're going to, ch they're going to be my whip to chastise you all. And then Habakkuk said, but I don't get that because they're, they're more wicked than we are. And how are you going to use a more wicked people than we are to correct us? If you don't believe that, look at verse 13, the last part of the verse, and it says this. He said, when the wicked devoureth the man that is more righteous than he. In other words, he's saying, how can you use them because they're, they're more wicked than we are? How can you use them to, to chastise us? It'd be like this. Let me bring it home. It'd be like this. God using the Russians, who are atheists, say there is no God. God using them to come to America and chastise America. At least we got God we trust on our, on our money and on our buildings. We're supposed to be a Christian nation, but God could use Russia to bring us down. How can God, how can God use a, a more wicked nation to punish a less wicked nation? How can that be so? How can God bring these old Chaldeans, the idolaters, wicked, filthy people, how can God use them to whoop and punish His people? At least the Israelites are not as bad as the Chaldeans are. Habakkuk said, I don't get it, God. Do you really know what you're doing? But the one thing we got to remember about all this is this. When God's people sin, it is worse than when unsaved people sin. Or can I say it like this? Sin in the life of a believer is worse than sin in the life of an unbeliever. You say, now preacher, explainify that one. Well, let me explainify it to you. You see, when a believer sins, he or she does so against a flood of light and an ocean of love. The truth of the matter is, you know, we as God's people, we know what's right. 
We've been preached to for crying out loud. We have a Bible. We've read our Bible. We've been preached to. We, we know what is right, and when we go out and disobey God, it is much worse than somebody that don't know what's right or what's wrong. And God is about to use this much worse people to chastise his own people. Because the sin in the life of the Israelites is much worse than the sin in the life of the Chaldeans. That's why, that's why we're constantly up fussing around here. Hey, be careful, man. Live clean. Stay close to God. Do right because it's much worse when we allow sin to come in our life than it is for somebody that never even darts the doors at God's house to allow sin to come in their life. You know why? We know they don't. And it brings a severer punishment. The more light that we have, the more severer the judgment's going to be. So God is going to use the Chaldeans to punish his own people. Well, you say, preacher, I don't get that. How can God work through these very wicked, ungodly people? Well, let, me, let me remind you something about God. God doesn't work with wickedness, but God can work through wickedness to bring about his own plan. Now, I've got to say that again because that just shot right over your head. But let me say it like this. God cannot work with wickedness. But God can work through wickedness to bring about His plan for our lives. It's, it's unbelievable, but listen to this. The Bible said in Psalm 76, verse number 10, 76, verse number 10, there it is, Surely the wrath of man shall praise thee. God can take something that man does that is so bad, so terrible, and God can turn it around and cause that event to bring praise to him. Boy, that's a big God, isn't it? I mean, here's God that can take a, a very wicked, ungodly people. God can't work with them, but God can work through them to bring about an episode that will cause him to be glorified. The, the wrath of man shall even praise the Lord. You say, preacher, I'm lost. I get it. Let me give you an illustration. What about Calvary? What about a horrible event called Calvary? God's Son taken by wicked and ungodly hands and crucified upon the cross. They, 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 they released their wrath and their anger and their fury upon the Son of God and God turned that right around and brought salvation for the whole entire world so that Ryland could stand up here over a while ago and say, he's the best thing that's ever happened to me. I'm just trying to say God is so great. God is so good. God can even take something bad, turn it around, and cause it to praise him. Now, don't you leave here thinking, well, the preacher's saying, well, I can go out and sin, live any way I want to, and God can get the glory from it. Not on your life. God never works with wickedness, but he can work through wickedness to bring about his plan for our lives. Habakkuk's in a mess. God, are you there? God, do you know what you're doing? Sometimes you ever want to look up to heaven and just say, God, I don't get it. I don't understand. God, do you really know what's going on down here? Do you need me to inform you? God don't need any information from you and me. He knows, and God is at work. Even when you and I don't see Him, God is pushing the levers. God is pulling the, uh, push, uh, pulling, pushing the levers, pushing the buttons. God is maneuvering the pieces. God is working in the situation because God can get glory even in the time of the wrath of man. So here's my whole message tonight, and I'm done. Here's three things I want you to take out the door with you tonight. Are you in a mess? You ever been like Habakkuk? I'm confused by all this. I don't get it. How in the world did we just lose this election? I don't get it, man. How could God let a man who loves Israel be replaced by a man who don't give a hoot about Israel? How can God let a man who hates, who will have little babies to be killed and let him replace a man who said, I don't want little babies to be killed. How can that happen? God, are you there? God, do you really know what you're doing? Maybe you're here in a, a predicament in your life tonight. 
And maybe those two questions are constantly on your mind. Are you there, God? God, are you listening? I'm pouring my heart out to you, Lord. I'm just, I'm laying it all before you. I'm spreading it out before you. God, are you there? God, I don't get it. It's getting worse. God, do you really know what you're doing? There's three things you take out the door with you. Number one, look up on the screens. When I don't think God is listening, He is. Habakkuk said in chapter 1 and verse number 2, I cry, but you don't hear me. But we know because we got the big picture now, God was hearing him the whole time. And can I just encourage you tonight and tell you this, when you don't think God is listening, He is. When you don't think God is listening to you, when you cry out in the middle of the night, when you pray, when you ask God to work in your behalf, when you are, are, are crying about a situation in your life, and it just don't seem like it, God is, is hearing you, He is. So number one, when I don't think God is listening, He is. Number two, when I don't think God has a plan, He does. Habakkuk said, God, I don't get it. Why aren't you doing something? Oh, God said, man, Habakkuk, I got a plan here, man. And you're not going to rush my plan because I've been working on this for a long time. But I'm getting ready to reach up here in the north and bring these Chaldeans down here. Son, I'm here to tell you, I've been working the whole time. I have a plan. And he does. When I don't think he's listening, he is. When I don't think he has a plan, he does. And number three, when I think things are out of control, they're not. You know why? Because they're under his control. What to me seems like complete... Can I tell you something? This situation in our nation, it's, to me, is completely out of control. But God's in control. He always has been, and He always will be. So whatever's going into your life tonight, God's listening. God is working because God has a plan behind it all. And it may take a while for that plan to unfold. But I'll tell you this, I'm 57 years old tonight, and I've been through maybe not as bad as what some of y'all have been through and been on some other situations. Maybe I've been through some things that maybe you never even dreamed you've had to go through. But the one thing I can tell you is this, I got through them. You know why I got through them? He was listening. He had a plan. He's in control. Regardless of how out of control things seem to be in my life, they're never out of His control. He is in control. And I want to close by giving you one of the greatest verses in the Bible. Here it is. Psalms 115, verse 3. Let's read it. But our God is in the heavens. Now here's my favorite part. He hath done whatsoever He hath pleased. You know what we call that? The sovereignty of God. The sovereignty of God. Don't let that scare you. A lot of people think, oh, sovereignty. Boy, He must be a Calvinist. I, I, hate, I don't hate Calvinists. Well, I do, but, but I ain't one. And they're not welcomed here at Woodland. Can I have an amen? amen? Calvinists are not welcome here at Woodland. But I believe in the sovereignty of God. I believe that God does whatever God wants to do. And He don't have to ask your permission or my permission. He don't have to get permission from the Congress or the Senate. He don't have to go through the Kremlin in Moscow. He don't have to go through the Parliament in, in, in England. God does whatever God wants to do. He does whatsoever He pleases. But He's always in control. He's always working things out to a plan. And He always hears the cries of his children. Are you there? Yes. Are, God, do you know what you're doing? Yes. Everything is going to be all right. Amen. Boy, it's kind of it's help. I don't know if it, it kind of helps me. I don't even watch the news no more. Do y'all? I don't even watch the news no more because I'm so done with the news. I, I'm so done with that. So I watch, I watch, I watch uh, Green Acres. 
because it makes more sense than Hogan's Heroes. Amen. Makes more sense than Carol Burnett. Makes more sense to me watching them news. I ain't going to get depressed by God. I'm not watching that mess let it ruin in my life, eat me up with ulcers. I'm just going to say he's listening, he's got a plan, and he's in control. And we can count on it. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this.